Hi, everybody. It's Mike. I wanted to let you know what you're going to be listening to today. Claude Call, who is a good friend of mine and a fellow podcaster in Baltimore, asked me to be on a crossover episode on his show, How Good It Is, one more time. Uh, We are discussing If You Could Read My Mind. Longtime fans of Carefree Highway Revisited will remember that he and I did this in November of 2021, and we were talking about the song Sundown. So that's what you're going to be hearing right now. My episode with Eileen Massover discussing Restless from the Waiting for You album will be coming out in early February 2023. And then I'll be releasing an episode with Jerry Candiston where we focus on Sit Down Young Stranger a couple of weeks after that. I also wanted to remind you that I've recently opened a shop on Etsy that features the logo of the podcast on several different items of swag that you might want to take a look at. Let me give you the URL for it. It's etsy.com slash shop slash chr podcast store. Let me give you that to you one more time. Etsy.com slash shop slash chr podcast store. I hope you'll visit, and I hope you'll check out some of our items. Okay, happy listening. The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates Gordon Lightfoot's music song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and with me today is a podcasting colleague and friend from Baltimore, Maryland, Claude Call. Hey, Claude, good to have you on the show. Hi, it's good to be back. Yes, because we talked about Sundown a while back Mm -hmm. uh, on another crossover, and so now we're just repeating our performance here, so to speak, but we're going to be talking about If You Could Read My Mind, which is another one of the real stalwarts in the Lightfoot canon. Yes, it is. And uh, I imagine that for me, like most Americans, this was my entry to Gordon Lightfoot. I actually remember hearing this song as a young kid. I would have been about mm, seven years old when this first came out, and I first heard it eh, not long after that. I don't remember hearing it as a radio hit, but I actually heard it first in a uh, hits collection, one of those like superstars of the 70s type record collections. Yeah. Well, Claude, do you know how it sort of got into the American consciousness, how this song in particular made it into people's ears? I did hear a story about how basically a DJ didn't really like the single that he was sent and he decided to play another track instead. And this one turned out to be it. And this is a story that crops up a lot during my show when I'm talking about various hit records and a DJ saying, I don't like this record. And he flips the record over and plays the B-side and he likes the B-side a whole lot more. And I was a little bit surprised to learn that this was not the B-side for a change. No, it was an album cut from the album, which was at that time called Sit Down Young Stranger. And the single that he had been given was a cover of Me and Bobby McGee, which, of course, Janis Joplin did Mm -hmm. uh, really over the top cover of. I think it was originally written by Chris Christopherson. Yeah. And they played If You Could Read My Mind, which was picked up by other DJs and the fans really liked it. And eventually the record company got in touch with Lightfoot and said, hey, we want to change the name of the album from Sit Down Young Stranger to If You Could Read My Mind, which led to this enormous confrontation in Hollywood. Lightfoot actually got on a plane to L.A. to try to convince the record company, don't change the name of my album. This is mine. And he was being kind of artistically possessive about it. I kind of wondered about that because when you're at that point in your career and you're talking first hit now, I don't know that you're in necessarily a position to make demands like that. And so there are going to be times, and I remember talking to um, Jim McCarty from the Yardbirds just a couple months ago and asking about decisions like this. And he was like, oh, that was totally out of our hands. We couldn't do anything about that, especially when it came to the American releases of our albums. So I imagine that Lightfoot went through pretty much the same arguments, even though it was a different label. It was still like, you know what? We got this. We know better than you. We're going to do whatever we want. 
And that's the way it wound up turning out, I'm sure. The other relevant piece of the puzzle here is that someone at the record company said to Lightfoot when they were having this discussion, they said, Lightfoot, you understand algebra, don't you? And Lightfoot said, yes. Okay, so the difference between leaving the title of the album as it is and changing it is the difference between X and 7X. And Lightfoot said, as soon as I realized that we were selling copies of the album like crazy once they'd changed the name of the album, I realized I'm never going to argue with a record exec <laughs> over a title of an album again. Well, that's clever on his part, actually. Now, as the story goes, my understanding is that this was like so many hits. It's, it's kind of weird. There are some songs which artists seem to have to like beat and beat and beat and beat into shape before it turns into a thing. And other songs... It just like pops into their head and they knock it out in a few hours and it becomes instant classic. And this was one of the latter where, where he did write this relatively quickly. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, you're right, Claude. It was written all in one afternoon. He was working in his house on Blythewood Road in Toronto and he's getting ready for his first album for Warner Brothers because I think he'd been with United Artists before then. It's about his first marriage, but he was really kind of sitting down at the table and saying, okay, I've got to write some songs. And it was written all in one afternoon. And he talked about it later in saying it's about peace through acceptance. And it's obviously stood the test of time because Lightfoot's written hundreds of songs as we're talking here in 2023. But he does this song, if you can read my mind, at pretty much every single concert that he ever does. So it's a bit like the Jimmy Buffett songs you know by heart. You, you can count on hearing this song at every Gordon Lightfoot show. And that's it's not necessarily a bad thing. Although, at the same time, I'm sure for him, there's got to be a little bit of, it's almost like PTSD. I got to do this again. I got to relive this moment again. And I understand, like, you know, there's, there's that question from the film, uh, Almost Famous. Do you have to be in love to write a love song? Do you have to be sad to write a sad song? And I don't think it's necessarily the case. I do think it helps the artist process a little bit. And it certainly helped in his case to, okay, let's do this thing and move on a little bit. Well, Claude, you bring up an interesting point, which is that you are intrigued by the writing process. Mm -hmm. And it does make me wonder, why do you like the song? Because it's one that you would do on your show with or without me, but... What made you want to talk about it with this little conversation? Well, I think part of it was there's not a ton of story behind it. It's pretty simple. You know, he was going through the thing. He wanted to process it a little bit for himself and get through this thing. And he wrote it very quickly. And boom, that was pretty much the end of it. And when there's a song like this that I really, really like, and there's not a ton of story behind it, eh, that's always a little bit disappointing because I got to fill out a little bit more time <laughs> when I'm doing my own <laughs> podcast. But yeah. one of the things I like and I wanted to talk about in this context, Gordon Lightfoot has always had just so much imagery going on. And, and I like the way that he presents himself in the lyrics and the stuff that he comes up with. And, and so to take his situation and turn it into a couple of similar yet different metaphors is just, just such a testament to the talent that he's got when it comes to his writing. I love the, the imagery that he comes up with. Whether it's this, whether it's Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which I covered solo way back early in my, the, the history of my show, or whether it's Sundown, which we did just a few months ago. You mentioned the imagery, which says a lot about his talent as a lyricist. Mm -hmm. I think just as important is that there's enough musical variety in it. So it's not just a poem. It's not just something that's written in blank verse. To me, it is the perfect Lightfoot song. It's personal, it's simple, and it is interesting, yet the arrangement is very, very straightforward. I mean, it's mm -hmm. guitar, bass, lead guitar, and then orchestration, which was done by either Nick DeCaro or maybe Randy Newman. I don't remember which. But it's not a terribly elaborate piece, and yet it's had amazing staying power and amazing success. We'll talk about how it charted and, you know, who else has covered it in a little while, I suppose. But to me, it is the absolute pinnacle of his songwriting talent. Yeah, I think so. And, and it's not to say, well, he peaked early and that was the end of that, clearly, because this was just the beginning for Lightfoot, really, uh, especially 
in the U.S. I mean, he'd already had a couple of hits in Canada, but this was the one that really broke him out here. As I said, like the imagery, and it, it's not complicated. It's fairly simple stuff that is very accessible to anyone. And at the same time, you were sharing with me some of previous information and how while we're, we're given something that we can pick up pretty quickly, and at the same time, you're a little bit confounded. And I did think about this a little bit. And I'm thinking specifically about mm-hmm. that first verse about, you know, an old time movie about a ghost from a wishing well. And you're like, what in the hell movie was that? And, you know, I, I thought about that. I was yeah. like, it's something that we can all latch on to very quickly. And yet at the same time, what movie would that have been? And I had to, I thought about it. I actually took some time to think about this one a little bit. And I came up with two possibilities, which he might have kind of melded together into one on this. One was the old Abbott Costello film, The Time of Their Lives, okay, from uh, 1946. And that is one in which Lou Costello, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who the co-star was, the female lead, they were both killed during the time of the Revolutionary War as traitors. And they were thrown down a well. And there was a curse (laughs) on them that where they, their innocence had to be proven for them to be released from the property that they were bound to. So, you know, 150, 200 years goes by and Bud Abbott comes along and finally they get found innocent and they manage to move on to the afterlife. And then there was another one around the same time, 1945, called I Know Where I'm Going, which does involve a castle and a well and a curse that's all attached to the whole thing. And they think it just a more evocative kind of imagery. And I think he kind of pushed those two films together. Because they're both old time movies. They both involve ghosts. They both involve wells. But I know where I'm going at least has the Scottish castle, but it's there. <laughs> you have to wonder, though, I mean, from going from Abbott and Costello to Gordon Lightfoot, mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. it's going from the sublime to the ridiculous in some ways, because this is a very serious, very sad song. And clearly, it's possible that Lightfoot had seen one or both of these movies. And they are old time movies. They would have been, you know, in the early 70s or the late 60s, they would Mm -hmm. have been considered old time movies. But I think he's really talking about just the fact that they are both telling a compelling story. They have nothing to do with the story that he himself is telling in this song. And I did not know about those two films. But of course, Lightfoot doesn't do a whole lot of explaining to journalists or other people (laughs) about all of the songs and certainly doesn't dissect the lyrics. And I don't think there's anything shameful about that. I mean, he wants to maintain the enigma and no, more he, power to him. He doesn't owe us anything. You know, they, I mean, what's the point of art is for you to react to it and to maybe interpret it and how you interpret it is kind of up to you because what you're going to respond to is not going to be the same thing that I respond to, or we're both going to respond to it, but not necessarily in the same way. And that is, is not necessarily a terrible thing. Let me move on then, because we talk about like you know the ridiculousness of an Abbott and Costello movie and this story about a sad relationship that's gone wrong. And then you move into the next verse, and he starts talking about a paperback novel, the kind the drugstores sell. And he's got to be talking about like the Harlequin romances, which were like remarkably cheap novels. Yes. They were written you know on the fly, very quickly, and they cranked out dozens. I think they would do a dozen novels every single month. It was like enormous library of Harlequin romances. And again, it's an image you can latch on to very quickly. And at the same time, the stories involved were forgettable. And they were, I mean, it's like this was the the literary equivalent, I guess, of like the Hallmark movies, you know, especially at Christmas time, <laughs> where they all seem to have like the same kind of plot and the bodice ripping picture on the cover and that, that sort yeah. of thing. And so... Same thing. It's an image you can grab onto quickly. Don't take it too literally, but you get the idea. No, you don't want to take it too literally. But on the other hand, in this one, he is bringing it just a little bit more close to the heart because he is taking some responsibility Mm. for the breaks in his marriage. And he has since gone on record as saying that he did a lot of womanizing. He did a lot of running around on his first wife. So the hero would be me, but heroes often fail You won't read that book again. She's not coming back to him. Right. And so it sounds like he's, if you want to look at it in terms of the Kugler-Ross 
cycle, he's approaching acceptance that <laughs> the end of his marriage has arrived. We'll be right back to our conversation with Claude Call about if he could read my mind. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. As kids, we were a blank sheet of paper with no life experience, and now we are paper balls full of perfect imperfections. Join me on the Grown Up Podcast as I explore these imperfections with you and occasional guests to give a different perspective on life that will make you think just a little deeper. Along the way, we celebrate independence by catching the waves of independent musicians with the Now segment, better known as Naturally on a Wave. If you're ready to smooth your imperfections so you can show up for yourself, then search Grown Up, look for the perfectly and perfect paper ball and press play tune into the grown-up podcast on apple Podcasts, spotify pandora iHeartRadio, and more oh yeah remember to subscribe so you'll never miss an episode radio is so much different than it was in the 80s we had it all the music the movies the djs and morning shows back to the 80s radio is a show from the 80s in podcast form we bring the memories from that awesome decade back Join Toscano and Chang every Friday as they take you on a ride back in time, sharing their experiences and laughs. Stop on by and discover some of the wacky things this crazy duo comes up with. They talk about it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the greatest decade. Don't miss the greatest 80s podcast in the world. Back to the 80s radio. And then he's coming back again to this whole idea of movies. Now, I don't know how much of an influence or how much of a movie buff Lightfoot is, but now he's talking about getting burned in a three-way script where he believes that he's too good to try and talk things out. He's a movie star, and number two, the movie queen to play the scene is the next woman that he's going to be involved with, and that may last a week, it may last a night, it may be the love of his life that he should have been with the whole time, but he's returning to the theme of cinema one more time here. Yeah, I mean, I think in this particular case, he's kind of casting himself as the hero, the guy who gets jilted at the altar and that sort of thing, and some other woman comes along and rescues him, as it were, emotionally. I guess it kind of works. You don't usually see that particular scenario. Usually it's the woman who gets jilted, but okay, we can run with it. Then he returns to the original theme of the ghost from the wishing well in the last verse. And he goes into this idea of reading between the lines. And this is one of the most brilliant lines I think he's ever written, because it's another way of him saying he wishes that she, the object of the song, would get the messages that he's not capable of sending in words. And if you can't communicate in words, how are they supposed to understand what you're saying? By reading your mind. So it really does dovetail back with the title of the song. Whether he was thinking about that or not when he wrote it, I'm not too sure, but it certainly works that way. Yeah, I think it works out really well. I, I do appreciate that. And, and, and especially in as much as men in general, let's face it, are not awesome about expressing how they feel, not appropriately always. And sometimes it's like, hey, I did this, I did this, I did that. Like we try to demonstrate rather than say, and eh, that doesn't always fly for us, does it? No, it doesn't. And it's led to more miscommunications between the sexes than will ever be recorded in history. Yeah. And that's probably not something we want to talk about too much here because we might get in trouble with the people we live with. I wanted to turn a little bit to the people who have covered this song okay. because there's a couple of really interesting stories about this. Numbers of people have covered it and made him a lot of money, but wasn't there an occasion or an event back in the 80s where Lightfoot had this idea that someone had ripped off the song? Yeah, actually, I, this was interesting. So it was in, uh, what about it, 1987, I think, that he did, in fact, sue the writer of Whitney Houston's hit, The Greatest Love of All, because he was of the impression that this writer, whose name briefly escapes me, basically took that bridge from Greatest Love of All, of I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow, and said that this is a ripoff of If You Could Read My Mind. Eventually, he dropped that suit. And I was listening to that and comparing the two. And I was like, mm, I guess maybe you could kind of hear it. How far would that go in court? Who really knows? Because just remember also, this was around the time that 
John Fogarty was being sued by his prior record company for yes. plagiarizing from himself. And mm -hmm. so he went into court with his guitar and it was like, well, this song is like this, ding, 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 ding. And this song is like this, ding, 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 ding. And here's how they're different. And so it's entirely possible that he might have been convinced, well, you know, yeah, you could sue, but who really gains in the end on this one? And I think also just the fact that it was going to affect Whitney Houston, who really had nothing to do with it other than being the singer yeah. of the song. She didn't write the thing. She didn't write most of her own material. So again, okay, I think I've made my point. And he was able to say, that's enough of that. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. The issue was settled out of court. The songwriter, whose name also escapes me for the moment, did issue a public apology, and that was the end of that. I do think that he might have had a case, but again, it would only have impacted Whitney Houston, and it would have made him look like a bad guy. Yeah. So I think he made a wise decision not to press that. The other story that I love about this song was that Lightfoot was actually nominated for a Grammy in 1972 oh. for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. And he was invited to play this song on the Grammy broadcast. Now, that is a huge deal mm -hmm. in the early 70s. I mean, and that is like the equivalent in those days of getting your picture on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. I don't know what the modern equivalent would be, but he wanted to do it, and the show's producers said, well, you have to cut the song down to two minutes because that's all we have time for in the program. And Lightfoot said, nope, I'm not doing it, and walked away. So he might have gotten a little bit more exposure if he had done that, but I have nothing but praise for the fact that he kept his artistic integrity there because I don't think you can tell the kind of story that he is telling in this song in two minutes or even three minutes. I think the thing clocks in at about four and change, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it does. You're right. I, I really don't blame him for the same reason. It's like, you can't really tell the story. You, you, if, even if he's like a verse and the chorus and wind it down, and you're still not necessarily getting the point of the overall thing, because he really is trying to tell a bigger picture here. There's a little bit of, I screwed up. There's a little bit of, you screwed up too. And then he comes toward the end and, there's kind of a joint blame thing there, but at the same time, he's really working his way through it. And as you say, like coming to the acceptance toward the end. And that that's a little bit of a journey that you can't quite make in two minutes. No. And I think if I were to listen to this and the thing was done in two minutes, no matter what segment of the song you kept, I would find it an unsatisfying listen. And so good on him for standing his ground on that. There have been a lot of covers of this one, Claude. Um, yeah. It's almost a who's who in music. Are there any that stand out to you? I rather like Glenn Campbell's version. Frankly, I was not impressed with Johnny Cash. I know a lot of people like that version. I was like, yeah, that one's okay. And then the other one I liked was Diana Krall, and she did that in a duet. And I'm trying to remember who she duetted with for it. I love listening to that one. Those are probably the biggies for me. What about yourself? Well, I did like Glenn Campbell's version. Johnny Cash has done justice to some Lightfoot songs. I don't think this one was particularly good. I liked Don Williams's version. Although it's not my cup of tea, I like what Stars on 54 did with the song. They actually made it into a dance track and didn't do a bad job. Again, it's not my taste in music, but they had a number two hit on the disco charts with this song. And if you're listening to the original, you'd think, how on earth could you make <laughs> this into something that would show up in a disco or Studio 54 or something like that? But they made it work. Yeah, and, it, it, you know, it works. And yeah, again, yeah, yeah. Not not necessarily my cup of chai there, but it's OK. I, mean, um, I think it's just more <laughs> says more about the production and the innovation that they had. Frank Sinatra did apparently try recording it at one point and then said, I can't sing this. There's too many words. Mm -hmm. So go figure. I don't know if I can imagine old blue eyes singing this one. Can you? Actually, I kind of can. Yeah. Because there are some songs that he takes and he kind of big bands them out and like, no, that wouldn't work. But there are other times when he can do that kind of quiet and slow. And yeah, I could see him like old school Sinatra, like really old school Sinatra kind of crooning this one out. Yeah, I think he would do a fabulous job on it. 
Well, I think the story that went down was that he was either a major investor in or maybe owned outright the company that Lightfoot was working with at that particular time. And yeah, so Reprise he, Records, sure. Yeah, he wanted to try it. So that's one of those great could have beens in music history. That might be the uh, theme for your next podcast, Claude. <laughs> I actually <laughs> thought about that doing an episode where basically a song was offered to one artist who turned it down and then somebody else did that. So I could conceivably, you know, slot this one into that sort of, well, I've already talked about it. Now I got to come up with other material. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to touch on before we left this was that this was just a monster hit mm -hmm. for Lightfoot. And as we've said in previous circumstances, he had done very well in Canada, but this was the first hit that really made it big in the States. And very quickly, okay, 27 on the Australian KMR, 28 on Australian Go Set, Number one on Canadian RPM, number one on Canadian RPM Adult Contemporary, 19 in New Zealand, 30 in the UK, number one in U.S. Billboard Easy Listening, and number five on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100. And I could go on, but I think you get the idea. I mean, this is just a tour de force of songwriting, and it really did signal that he was not just going to be confined to the Canadian market anymore. Sure. And also just for the entire year, top 40 for the year in the U.S. and top 20 in Canada. All right. Well, great. Well, Claude, this has been a lot of fun. We're talking about an amazing song and I'm doing it in amazing company. So thanks for taking a few minutes to talk with me today. Thank you so much. I always have a blast working with you here. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much, and I want to keep it going, and you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. Well, our next episode will feature my guest Eileen Massover, and she and I will be discussing Gordon's song Restless from the Waiting for You album, and that episode will be coming out in early February. Until then, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time. 